um, simulation of Hamiltonians. They always think, you know, oh, this is for chemistry. You know, this is all, uh, uh, that's all that these applications are set up for. The right way to think about Hamiltonian simulation is Hamiltonian simulation is a compilation paradigm. It says, for cases where you want to implement a unitary matrix, but you only know that unitary matrix as an exponential of a Hermitian matrix, this tells you how to compile that into a sequence of gates. And so these techniques, of course, have found applications all over the place because of the fact that it's kind of one of the broadest set of techniques that we end up having for it. Naturally, of course, because there's been so much uh, attention because of the applications to chemistry or field theory, there have been a host of adva advances in the last little while. And I'm going to be talking about a um, number of papers here. I, I, uh, I was on the majority of them, uh, but I'll partially be talking about this one over here that I'm not on, which is uh, kind of a simpler version of the paper that Guang Hao and I did. So the Basic, basic thing that I want to be able to get across is I really want to get across how some of the techniques that have shown up in these papers have really actually kind of caused us to have a better unified understanding of how many of these methods play together and exactly what the actual errors are. And one of the, the most surprising results that actually ends up coming out of this is that we find you know, methods from linear combinations of unitaries over here that actually can, in some cases, dramatically outperform quote unquote, you know, optimal simulation methods by exploiting structure in the matrix. But the thing that's really kind of neat is that these techniques ended up showing us that we can actually simulate uh, some problems in chemistry much more efficiently than we figured. But recent uh, work uh, that was done by, with Yohan Su, Andrew, and a bunch of other people ended up actually showing that even just using a dumb Trotter formula, believe it or not, for these problems, without using any of those fancy techniques, we can come close to matching the same performance. And so these are, this really ends up showing that actually, yeah, there's more life in Trotter than probably I would have guessed two years previous. So to talk about it, yeah, basically, the, yeah, this is what I'm going to, going to do. I'm going to talk about Basically, mostly, mostly what I'm going to talk about is time-dependent simulation. The reason why is almost all of the techniques that I'm going to be talking about, even when we're taking a look at time-independent Hamiltonians, are going to actually end up using time-dependent Hamiltonians as part of the proof technique. So I'm going to need to spend some time reminding you about how uh, simulation for time-dependent Hamiltonians ends up looking. Uh, then I'm going to talk about um, um, uh, improved bounds for the Trotter formula and show how these improved bounds actually can end up y yielding simulations of field theory, well, at least a very simple uh, lattice gauge theory, uh, where the Trotter simulation actually outperforms what we would end up seeing if we used an optimal method like qubitization or linear combinations of unitaries. So that's sort of the overview of the talk. And so, OK, time-dependent Hamiltonians. What are they and why do we need them? Well, time-dependent Hamiltonians basically model systems that have external classical control. So imagine what you have is you have, say, a um, pair of molecules that are colliding together. If those molecules are sufficiently heavy, basically the center of mass for the nuclei as they're going towards each other can be treated classically or semi-classically, whereas the electrons, because they're so much lighter, often you'll need a full quantum mechanical treatment. From that perspective, the position of the, uh, the, the, the nuclei can be seen as just a time-dependent classical trajectory that these things are going through, in which case the nuclear forces acting on the electrons are going to also be time-dependent. So that's an example of a time-dependent Hamiltonian. But perhaps the one that everybody here is most familiar with is a quantum computer itself. Because with a quantum computer, right, what you want to do is you want to be able to turn on and off gates at different times based on classical control signals. And so from that perspective, the mathematical model of that quantum system is fundamentally given by a time-dependent Hamiltonian. And the thought about quantum simulation methods uh, for time-dependent Hamiltonians actually began by studying models like adiabatic quantum computing in order to be able to show that adiabatic quantum computing is equivalent to ordinary quantum computing, it was necessary to show that the time-dependent Hamiltonians it uses can be simulated on a quantum computer. So that's actually where all of this, uh, this stuff originally ended up getting developed. So all right, cool. So 
for if we've got a time dependent Hamiltonian, then the time evolution operator is the solution to this operator differential equation up here. So normally, if we, we'd have this, the solution would be like a, a matrix exponential to this, e to the minus i h t. But the problem is, is that if h is a function of time, it turns out that there isn't a closed form expression in general for this. And the symbolic solution that we, we use for the solution is uh, this time ordered operator exponential over here. Okay? And if we want to get a better idea about what this thing looks like, the easiest way to do this is to um, um, do a uh, look at the Dyson series for it. Which is, um, and the easiest way to find out what the Dyson series is, is to do a Wikipedia search. But because of the fact that I don't do a Wikipedia search, what I did last night to make sure I got the formula right is I did a Bing search, and this apparently is what the Dyson series is. <laughs> Right? Uh, I, it's less funny, but it turns out the next uh, link that it recommends actually is the Dyson series on Wikipedia. Or alternatively, you can go on Google and the number one link is actually what you want. But anyways, the real Dyson series is actually this thing over here. So the, uh, this over here, you can think of as a generalization of a Taylor series. In fact, actually for the case, where all of the, the uh, Hamiltonian terms are time independent, when you do all these integrals, you end up getting the 1 over n factorial terms that you would end up expecting. So it really is just a generalization of Taylor's theorem. But there's one, a couple of things that it's important to note are a little bit subtle and different about this. The first thing is, is that h of t, right, it's a time dependent matrix. So it may not actually commute with itself at all times. So that means that when we're Considering simulating a Dyson series, the ordering of when each of these Hamiltonian terms ends up occurring inside this sum is really important. And that, that's, going, uh, that's something that's going to be important to bear in mind when we talk about simulating this on quantum computers. Because what we're going to have to do in order to implement this is we're going to have to keep track of when each of those individual Hamiltonian terms is supposed to fire by creating an auxiliary clock register. Okay. So that's basically how the, the, the whole thing ends up going. So a couple of problems existed you know, kind of two years back in the, in the era that Andres was mostly talking about, although he did cheat in the end and ended up uh, giving away some of my punchlines. But uh, that, aside from that point, the kind of questions that we were asking is, OK, if we're looking at simulating a time-dependent Hamiltonian of this form, does the scaling of the simulation end up depending on kind of the average case properties of the Hamiltonian? Because obviously, if you've got a Hamiltonian that's depending on time, right, it could happen that at some point in time, the Hamiltonian becomes ludicrously difficult to simulate. And then after that, it's trivial. Like, for example, if you had an impulsive interaction, right? where the interaction is basically 0, 0, 0, 0, then all of a sudden, there's an incredibly strong interaction between two systems. In that case, if you had to pay the full cost for simulation when the systems aren't interacting, that would be incredibly wasteful. And it was unknown at the time whether or not it was possible even to be able to get simulation methods that scaled with kind of the average value of the Hamiltonian rather than the worst case value. The next question is, what, what's the role of the derivatives of the Hamiltonian? If the Hamiltonian is changing over time, right, then it, it, may, it makes sense that the smoothness of the Hamiltonian should somehow be relevant for the simulation. And so the question is, well, how? Is it polynomial? Is it logarithmic? How does this end up coming in? And with all the analyses that had been done on the Trotter formula side of things, it strongly suggested that in many cases, the dependence was polynomial. However, there was randomized work that ended up coming out earlier by, uh, I think, Poulin, Verstrati, and Soma that ended up showing that actually the low order formulas ended up existing that only depended on the average formula that worked basically by Monte Carlo sampling terms in the Hamiltonian and using a Monte Carlo integral in order to effectively approximate this up here. So that was the intuition behind the, their method. So, those are sort of the main questions. And the first kind of stab at, at this that I'm going to be talking about is the linear combinations approach. Now, something that's actually kind of interesting is that QDRIF, which was Earl Campbell's uh, approach, you know, sometimes he, which he called a randomized compiler for evolution. Actually, the interesting thing is, is that it actually really should be thought of not like a Trotter formula, kind of like Earl Campbell 
suggested it was. But rather, it should actually be thought of as a linear combination of unitaries method. Okay. So the basic idea, as Andras ended up saying in his talk, is that if we've got a Hamiltonian that's a sum of uh, a bunch of unitary operations, then what we can do is we can create a circuit that block encodes the Hamiltonian by using these two objects, a prepare and a select register over here. And basically what the prepare register ends up doing is it ends up preparing the coefficients of the state and the select ends up implementing each of the individual terms in this linear combination. And selected on measuring zero up here at the end, you'll have applied the Hamiltonian to it. And you can use this idea in order to be able to implement a Taylor series because a Taylor series is just a sum of Hamiltonians. And using this trick to do a sum of sums, then you can end up implementing e to the minus iht. So what we're going to do in this particular case is if we want to be able to apply this to a time-dependent Hamiltonian, well, we'll do the exact same thing but to a Dyson series. All right. Now, let's take a look at Q-drift, though, in this framework. The Q-drift algorithm actually is re uh, really, really simple. What it actually ends up looking like is this. Okay. So the main difference between the two is in for LCU, what you have is you have a whole bunch of unitaries that are all being quantumly controlled and fired, you know, fired coherently with uh, these prepare circuits telling you with what amplitude you should be, be firing them. With Q-drift, you don't do that at all. What you do is you decompose the evolution into a bunch of unitaries and then you Monte Carlo sample over those unitaries. So you replace the quantum control with classical control. Now, the scaling of the algorithms, it turns out, is actually very similar. The scaling ends up depending on, uh, for LCU, on the sum of the absolute values of these coefficients. And similarly, for Q-drift, it also depends on the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. It does not depend on the commutators, like Trotter formulas do. So that's the idea. And one of the, the, the cute things about Q-drift is the fact that, unlike LCU, it doesn't require all of these uh, additional qubits. And if you're looking at applying something on near-term quantum, uh, quantum devices where you've got a small number of qubits, LCU can be kind of punishing because of that, whereas Q-drift isn't. Now, it, this will come at a price. But the question is, if we're looking at simulating time-dependent Hamiltonians, which is the most general case that we can kind of look at, at least for Hamiltonian simulation, what kind of overheads end up coming in with that? And so that's the first thing I'm going to begin with, because from my perspective, LCU is actually a little more complicated than Q-drift, because with Q-drift, well, we don't have the control register. So basically, the idea ends up being, um, say we, what we want to do is we want to be able to approximate the time-ordered uh, time operator exponential, which in, um, is this thing over here. So the way that we end up doing this is that what what we do is we can say that, all right, let's take this channel over here. So what this channel ends up doing is it says, OK, I'm going to assume that my Hamiltonian only contains one term, just for simplicity here. OK? But that term is time dependent. So in order to be able to simulate it, what I do is I pick a time randomly between the beginning and end point with some weight, and then only evolve the system for a short time step according to that fixed Hamiltonian that I sample. All right. Now, if you, if you go through a, a Taylor series expansion of this channel over here versus the Dyson series up here, then what you end up getting is you end up finding that this over here to leading order will end up actually causing the P's over here to cancel. So any probability distribution that you end up picking uh, will end up actually giving you to leading order the time evolution that you need. So that's actually really kind of neat. And the, but the question is, how do you end up choosing this probability? The idea basically is that just like important sampling, you want to be able to pick the probability distribution that kind of minimizes the variance in some sense of all of these terms. Because uh, what will end up happening is that if we choose a very bad uh, P, of, a P of tau over here for this distribution, then the higher order terms are just going to kind of go all over the place. So the natural choice to end up do, uh, to, to do is to basically end up picking each of the terms according to the um, maximum value of, uh, of um, 
the or sorry the the Staten infinity norm, which is like the uh, spectral norm of the Hamiltonian evaluated at a particular time divided by a normalized a normalizing coefficient, which is really just the integral of all of those. So this is the probability distribution that we, we pick that will minimize uh, these errors on top of that. And then what we can do is we can say that if we end up picking it according to this, then the diamond distance between the channel that we would like to do for the ideal time evolution operator and the one that we get by randomly sampling uh, a time evolution at one of those points ends up actually uh, uh, just going like the square of the um, um, uh, spectral norm uh, integrated over time. So what this ends up saying is something really kind of cool, right? The error in this case doesn't actually end up depending on the maximum value of the function in between. Because we're randomly sampling, this argument ends up saying that actually it depends on the average value. So if you've got a case that ends up looking like a, you know, kind of like a Dirac delta function that's strongly impulsive, this discussion, uh, this, uh, this lemma ends up saying that that doesn't matter. The thing that matters is the integral. So if the average of the impulse over the entire interval is decent, then the cost of simulation isn't actually all that high, which is, a, which is kind of a cool result. Um, and by the way, I should mention that this result over here technically it only really will end up giving you a good bound for a short time evolution. Because this subscript 1, it means the integral over the time that you're, you're looking at. So if we want to break this up into a sequence of uh, our long evolution time, this will kind of go quadratically with the evolution time. So we, what we want to do is we want to break this up into a series of short evolutions and slice them together. When we slice them together, what we end up finding, more or less, is that the total cost, gate complexity of the simulation ends up going like the sum of the absolute values of the, of the individual coefficients in the Hamiltonian integrated over time squared. Okay? So it scales like the average value uh, of the coefficients, even when we slice this up into a series of short time, time steps. And again, this is fantastic because of the fact that if we had have used, say, uh, older school Trotter formulas, we would have ended up getting scaling that depended on you know, the maximum value or the average value, but it would also have had uh, uh, parameters that depend on the higher order derivatives. This formula does not actually depend whatsoever on the derivatives. It only depends on the average value. So that's, that's really kind of cool. And so the question is, all right, great. This is what we ended up getting by doing things um, using classical control. If we go back and you know, consider the LCU to Q-drift mapping and replace the classical control of all the unitaries that we end up having in here with quantum control, then what exactly are the advantages that we could conceivably get for this? And so going through, the way that we end up doing this, as I mentioned before, is we use a truncated Dyson series expansion. So we use that Dyson series, uh, but with fewer vacuums. Um, I guess unless you're simulating field theory. Oh, come on. Oh, good. <laughs> Anyways, the, um, the uh, um, the Dyson series, the, one of the key things that ends up differing from the truncated Taylor series simulation that Andrash talked about is that what we need to do is when we're triggering all of these individual Hamiltonians, we need to, uh, we need to encode the cl a clock register that tells each of those Hamiltonian terms whether it's time for them to fire or whether it's not time for them to fire when we're discretizing this integral. Because if we discretize this integral and we have, you know, T1 over here happening before T2, then these things are out of order, right? Because these integrals have a very specific order about when uh, each of them is supposed to go in. So what we need to do is we need to not only set up a clock, but we need to make sure that the times associated with that clock are properly ordered. And this can be done using some uh, comparison logic. And basically the idea is, is that we set up some amplitudes on each of the individual times and then we test to see whether or not uh, the term is out of order or not. And the simplest version of this ends up basically setting the amplitude to zero for all out of order terms by doing a comparison test. Okay? And this circuit will, will end up checking for it. So the, 
version, version of this that uh, Guang Hao and I ended up doing, when we went through the entire construction, we did all the linear combinations of unitaries, used oblivious amplitude amplification in order to boost the probability of success to basically 100%. Then what we end up getting is we end up getting the following result. Um, I, to contextualize it, the, the most important thing is that we end up getting near linear simulation, uh, near linear scaling with a simulation time. Um, over, uh, over here, we get linear scaling with the maximum value of the Hamiltonian in each of the segments. Now that's a bit of a bummer compared to QDrift. What we can do is if we have an idea of how bad though, the, uh, the norm of the Hamiltonian is in each of these individual segments. We can kind of, we can, we can deal with that a little bit by adjusting the algorithm appropriately and slicing up the time evolution. But if we're not given any promises about how bad the uh, norm of the Hamiltonian is in each of the segments, unfortunately, actually, this approach is inferior to the random sampling, where Monte Carlo uh, integration comes through and saves the day effectively. Okay? So, that's what we end up getting from it. But the thing that actually really kind of struck me about this, which is kind of you know, remarkable, is that in terms of the queries to, the, to an oracle that encodes the Hamiltonian, the cost does not depend on the derivatives of the Hamiltonian. It only depends on the magnitude of the Hamiltonian. So what that says is that says, apart from this logarithmic cost, which comes in from setting the scale of the, uh, or the discretization of the clock that we're using, the derivatives actually more or less don't matter for the simulation method, which is kind of, you know, it's supposed it isn't so surprising when I started with QDrift, where they literally don't matter. But in this case, we've got nearly optimal scaling and worst case scenario have logs uh, scaling with the derivatives. And so I, I focus on this, yeah. Monte Carlo method also has this polylog one or epsilon dependence of the curry complexity. Uh, no, actually, it's got polynomial uh, dependence. So this is much better, vastly better in, uh, in that. It's quadratically better in terms of the scaling with time, too. So the question is, because of this gulf between that, can you actually exploit the fact that simulating very rapidly changing Hamiltonians, in some sense, is exponentially better than what you would believe if you just used naive time slicing? And the answer is, yeah, you can. And the idea behind this is uh, it, the interaction uh, picture simulation method. And the idea is, imagine you've got two terms in your Hamiltonian, right? Um, A and B. What we can do is we can end up basically saying, all right, let's now go into, an, we can take some of the time dependence for one of the terms and absorb that time dependence in the state. And at the price of making our time de independent Hamiltonian time dependent. So if we've got a really big term that's evolving like crazy, causing the phase to kind of wrap around, what we can do is we can absorb the dynamics of that quickly evolving thing at the price of having a very, very rapidly changing Hamiltonian. But I just said, that you don't have to pay a big cost using the previous method if you've got a rapidly uh, varying Hamiltonian. You only pay costs that goes like the derivative, or the, the log of the derivative, not linearly with the derivative. So by taking a big term in a Hamiltonian, shifting it into the uh, interaction frame that you're using in this representation, you can use the truncated uh, Dyson series method to get huge advantages for simulating the Hamiltonian. And so the, the key point is that if you end up doing this, here's the theorem, I won't bother boring you with the details, but the key thing is is that the, if you do this and you can fast forward the dynamics is then simulate the dynamics of the expensive term at low cost or constant or logarithmic for that matter, then in that case, what the cost basically only ends up depending on the magnitude of the smaller term and logarithmically with the bigger one. And so, you know, to, just to give you an example, if you had a diagonally dominant Hamiltonian of this form over here, where you've got terms that are, say, a million on the diagonal versus relatively small terms on the off diagonal, this sort of a transformation is enormously valuable because otherwise you would have had to have paid full cost for all of these terms. Whereas if you use the interaction picture, you only have to pay logarithmic cost for those diagonal terms. And this ended up actually um, kind of inspiring us because we asked, well, is chemistry diagonally dominant? And it turns out, yeah, actually it is. 
And so we could use this in order to be able to simulate chemistry in a plane wave basis and show that what we can do is we can end up getting scaling that goes quadratically with the number of orbitals that we end up having in the problem, whereas the be previous best method ended up going like eight, uh, the 8 thirds. So you know, polynomial speed up. Okay, not a very big one, but it, I, I still liked it. And it's still state-of-the-art scaling. But this ends up bringing up the other point that Andrash ended up uh, raising, which is the unreasonable performance of Trotter formulas. So Trotter formulas uh, end, uh, scale far worse, at least according to the bounds that people had looked at in the past for these problems. But the question is, well, is this fundamental or is this a problem with our analysis? Now, to give you an idea about why there's a problem with our analysis, the standard way that people ended up um, taking a look at the error in Trotter formulas, let's see if I've got it. Nope, I don't. Standard way that people ended up uh, taking a look at the error in the Trotter formulas is that you want to be able to figure out what's the difference between e to the a plus b and e to the a times e to the b. So a natural tool for looking at that would be something like uh, the baker campbell house door formula or the Zazenhaus formula. The problem is, is that you get these nasty combinatorial expansions of exponentially many commutators popping up with it. And being able to go through and bound the remainder of, uh, of this series, which also incidentally doesn't converge um, in general. And uh, it's um, bounding all, all of that stuff and being able to retain the commutator structure was something that was actually incredibly difficult. And I'd tried for years and I'd utterly failed. But thankfully, Andrew has an incredibly good uh, graduate student who realized, hey, wait a second. How about looking at a, this from a different perspective? Can we actually end up looking at the Trotter formulas themselves as a time-dependent Hamiltonian? So it's a weird thing. But if you think about it, right, when you've got a, um, a, a Trotter formula, it's kind of like piecewise constant. It's like one term in a Hamiltonian's active, and the rest are off. And then they're just kind of like switching on and off like a light switch. So at some level, actually, fundamentally, the object that you're looking at is actually a time-dependent Hamiltonian. So it becomes actually more, much more natural to look at it in that language once you make that realization. And so once that, that's used, a technique, um, we use a technique called variation of parameters to be able to do this. And, um, the key thing is, is we get a multiplicative and also a uh, additive error uh, bound on this. And we end up finding that even for high order formulas, which would have had exponentially many commutators that we would have had to have bounded using the um, uh, standard baker campbell Hausdorff formula-like expansion, this variation of parameters trick allows us to explicitly say, yeah, actually, it ends up depending on this relatively simple nested, uh, norm of uh, nested commutators up at the top. And this, it was, a, it was actually key for us to be able to analyze what the cost of chemistry is. Because in general, if we want to get the best scaling, what we have to do is we have to kind of iteratively change the order of the uh, Trotter-Suzuki approximation as we need more and more accuracy, or the evolution time stretches out longer. And without these high order bounds like this, we had no idea how the error would actually end up scaling as we went to bigger and bigger, or higher and higher order formulas. Okay, And so I'm kind of running low on time, so I'll, I'll, I'll gl gloss over all of this. The key result for electronic structure over here is that we're able to actually also get order n squared simulation time. But fortunately, you know, all of my all of the work that Guang Hao and I did ended up doing in um, uh, for the interaction picture wasn't totally in vain because of the fact that there was this little O1 which caused some consternation in uh, uh, in Andrash's talk. So the scaling with time and epsilon is actually uh, worse. It's subpolynomial uh, uh, scaling with epsilon, but not polylogarithmic. Whereas the truncated uh, Dyson series ends up getting you polylogarithmic. So if you need extremely accurate scaling with epsilon, the interaction picture uh, uh, simulation method is better. But if you only care about your scaling with the number of orbitals that you ha you're using in your molecular model, they're both basically about the same. So what this ends up showing is that the gulf between what Trotter formulas, or at least high order Trotter formulas can do for these applications, and uh, what 
um, what we can do using more sophisticated methods is actually relatively slim. Also, another thing that I should, I should mention that's really kind of cool is that these error bounds actually end up uh, uh, being useful for Monte Carlo simulation because we can prove multiplicative forms of this. So for Monte Carlo simulation, actually, we can um, look at simulating transverse Ising models with a polynomially better model uh, method. Bravi's method before this ended up scaling like n to the 59. And using our, uh, our improved error bounds, we can actually bring it down to a svelte n to the 45. And I'm really excited about this, because this means that we actually might have a chance now of applying this algorithm for n equals 2. <laughs> I know, right? That's a result only QIP could love. Oh, yeah, it got accepted there. Um, <laughs> So uh, I don't have enough time to go over the technique, but it's a variation of parameters. And uh, this technique in various forms is actually used for some proofs of low order Trotter formulas done by Hastings et al. But um, here we generalize it and apply it uh, uh, across the board. So I'm really running out of time. But let's, uh, let's now say, OK, well, what if Trotter formulas aren't good enough for you? right? What if you'd like to have, be able to work in a unified picture between the two? Andresh mentioned that there was this stuff called multi-product formulas that you could potentially do. Ironically, multi-product formulas aren't really a new LCU technique. When Andrew and I first uh, uh, started looking at this, this approach, this was actually the thing that we, we considered. But the problem is, is that we didn't know about oblivious amplitude amplification at the time. So we really couldn't get the success probability uh, high without using some crazy gadgets that ended up killing the performance. So um, Guang Hao and Vadim and I, we started asking, well, now that we know about oblivious amplitude amplification, can we get this to work? And is there some way we can use this idea of having sums of product formulas rather than uh, sums of ordinary unitaries to kind of build a bridge between Trotter formulas and LCU? And the answer is yes, actually, we can. And the way that this ends up working is actually a very similar idea to what well, Andrash talked about for constructing high order Trotter formulas. But because of the fact that the approximation is a sum of Trotter formulas, not a product of them, what we end up with is we end up with actually a linear system that we have to solve in order to be able to ensure that the error cancels to appropriate order. So what this is saying over here is basically we want the formula to be exact to leading order, but we want all the higher order errors uh, to cancel out. In the simplest case, this over here uh, can be f these coefficients over here for the uh, terms in the expansion can be found by inverting a van der Mohn matrix. But we need to uh, do something a little fancier. So what we do is we um, can solve this either using linear programming or an approximate solution can be found using Chebyshev polynomials. When we stick this in, what we end up getting is we end up getting basically that we can achieve linear scaling with, uh, with the time in this particular case, and the one norm of the coefficients in the Hamiltonian. And we can almost get uh, as, uh, uh, as good scaling as the ordinary technique, as the optimal techniques. But unfortunately, we get log squared 1 over epsilon. And an open question is, yeah, well, is it possible using this technique, act, or using a technique, to reduce this down to logarithmic scaling? I suspect it's yes, but I don't know how. All right. Now, the final thing I'm going to talk about is simulation of the Schwinger model. So now that we have these new techniques, can we apply them to some practical example and get concrete improvements in the gate counts? Now, the Schwinger model is something that people have been talking about simulating for a while. There's a number of papers on it. But a major problem is, is that I found out after learning about this subject that all those papers kind of suck. And the r reason why they kind of suck is because of the, 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 the Hamiltonian over here. So the Hamiltonian, what it's supposed to model is electrons and positrons at, ne at nearby sites that interact with each other through a gauge field. The gauge field, you can sort of think of as being photons, but it's actually not quite. So the basic idea is, is that you've got the electric, um, uh, so there's no Coulomb interaction, just the gauge field ends up it's kind of simulating that. And the interaction term basically involves uh, a lowering operator for the electric field over here in exchange for causing the uh, 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 electrons to hop, or electrons and positrons to hop. And so that's, it looks kind of like a James Cummings interaction. And so the reason why all of this kind of sucked in the past was because of the fact that these raising and lowering operators 
all the work previous to this ended up um, using uh, a poly decomposition because they were only interested in doing this on near-term devices. Turns out the poly decomposition, though, for the uh, raising and lowering operators on the gauge field here, UR and UR dagger, those actually have an exponentially large poly decomposition, which is sad. So what we had to do is we had to go and find a new way of doing it. Turns out the raising and lowering operators can be implemented directly by uh, adding adder circuits. And so by using adder circuits, we were able to come up with a scalable version of this. So we looked at Trotter decomposition. And the reason why we looked at the Trotter decomposition is because of the fact that it's got a very, very nice uh, air bound over here. See? Take a look. I mean, <laughs> but the thing that's really nice about this, even though it's ghastly and there's no chance of you remembering what it is, even if you knew what the definitions of all of these different uh, 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 hopping as well as diagonal terms in the Hamiltonian are, is that the error, as I said before, depends on the commutators of all of these terms. If we go back and take a look at the commutators, it turns out the lowering operator commuting with a number operator squared over here ends up actually lowering the degree of that, uh, that by, by one. So rather than the cost, because it's a commutator, ending up scaling quadratically with the maximum electric field that you can end up having in a problem, it turns out because of the commutators, it only scales linearly. But if we use qubitization, uh, LCU, or Q-drift, we'd have to pay a cost that would end up going like the maximum value of this ER squared. So this actually ends up leading, in the case where we need a large uh, uh, cutoff for our gauge field, to a pretty big advantage for Trotter over the other techniques. So going through all of this. And this one doesn't use cutoff? Um, this one does use a cutoff, yeah. So I didn't mention the cutoff over here, but this cutoff value, we pick up a cutoff value of lambda. And so once we end up hitting it for practical purposes, we assume it's periodic. So it just wraps around. But ideally, hopefully, your field shouldn't be hitting a cutoff anyway. So that choice is kind of irrelevant. So what do you mean by outperforms LCU in terms of cutoff? Uh, so in terms of like if you, when you set the maximum uh, strength of the field that you can have in each of these terms, right? Think of this field as a register, right? It's got length uh, 2 to the n. And so the cost ends up scaling basically like 2 to the n, effectively. And so the. Um, cost that you would end up getting using qubitization is the maximum value. It's related to the maximum value of the gauge field that you can get in each of those sites. Whereas with Trotter, it depends on the commutator of that operator. And the commutator is polynomially smaller than the actual operator in this case. And that gives us an advantage. And so when we do this, we end up getting the, the following scaling where we get linear rather than quadratic scaling with this lambda parameter, which is the cutoff. So this shows that, yeah, these, that a deeper understanding of Trotter formulas can end up leading to a better understanding of uh, what the uh, scaling of the resources are. And actually, we even went through a little bit further in this and figured out the total number of T gates and found that, yeah, this looks like a totally practical application. You know, for even modest time evolutions, it only takes like 10 to the 11 gates. So, you know, I, any time now, right? Um, but the, the, uh, the interesting thing is that Trotter does perform very, very well for these, uh, these particular cases. And we need to continue to understand how all of these approximations play together. Because the reality is, if we want to get these numbers for these sorts of simulations down to something lower, it's doubtful that this is clearly going to be the method that we pick. So by understanding how all of the different approximations end up playing together, and perhaps even using them selectively to dissect different parts of the problem, that's probably what we're going to actually need in order to be able to reduce some of these gate, uh, gate counts from, depending if we use sampling or amplitude estimation for this example, down from you know, 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 11th, down to hopefully something more like 10 to the 6. So that's basically it. So I think that actually kind of the biggest message that I, I would like to make about, about Hamiltonian simulation. If you got nothing else out of the talk, really, I would say that the last two years for Hamiltonian simulation have had monumental, uh, monumental changes. Well, Hamil and Hamiltonian, well, Hamiltonian simulation itself has actually been one of the most rapidly changing parts of uh, quantum algorithms in general. It's actually been accelerating, if anything. In terms of both the level of sophistication for the specialized algorithms, which I didn't talk about, 
or also the more uh, general algorithms for simulating arbitrary dynamics. There's a lot of new capabilities that are coming to play with this. And because of the importance of Hamiltonian simulation as a fundamental primitive for many other quantum algorithms, I think it's really important that, that people start paying attention to some of these techniques. Because ideas like blo uh, block encoding, as well as singular value transformation, and uh, some of the related cubitization ideas that ended up popping out are really, really important techniques just to use in general, whether you're interested in uh, linear algebra, quantum machine learning, or whatever. So I really think that there, there's been a, a huge amount of change. And I'm, I'm really excited about the direction the field's going to go, because I strongly suspect that, the, uh, that if somebody's talking about this at Simons in two years, that the next two years are probably going to have as much change, if not more, than a change that we've seen uh, since the last one. Thank you very much. Um, you made a comment about having like delta functions in your time evolution. So, for instance, if you have a Hamiltonian and the energy has like a Lorentzian with some finite width, uh, what type of Hamiltonian simulation algorithm would you use? Um, this is like where the Trotter step is actually less than the width of the Lorentzian, um, but to be able to resolve those dynamics that are happening on such a fast time scale. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you've got a number of different options, right? Uh, if you end up having a priori knowledge about what the form of the distribution is beforehand, then you can use a whole bunch of adaptive techniques in order to be able to deal with that. No. Okay, assuming you don't, then probably your best bet is uh, Q-drift. Q-drift? Yeah. Well, either that or else you can al also end up using uh, the um, uh, Poulin or Soma algor a randomized algorithm. One of those two approaches would probably be the best for you. If you and if you want to do it on near-term-ish devices, Q-drift without a question. Okay. Okay, so I think uh, one more question maybe, and then we're going to um, have a short break before the panel discussion. I think I'm going up. So, um, so it was a great talk, Nathan. And, and uh, um, you know, I was going to say that when one um, does classical simulations with Trotter, you know, we've always not worried about those scary bounds that you would write down. And I'm glad, basically, what the truth is one doesn't have to worry about them. But, but one thing, um, one thing I have a question I was curious about is, you know, there's a lot of emphasis on what I might call the time step error in Trotter and how, how it matters. But when, when doing simulations, uh, doing numerical integration, that time step error is not necessarily the most important thing that one worries about. So when one's integrating differential equations forward in time, when you have stiff equations, then you can use integrators which you know, are accurate to certain orders in time. But some of them, if you just, if you just follow them in time, then suddenly the error will blow up. And then other stable integrators, they, you know, the, the errors, even if they're lower order integrators, they retain the stable solution in time. And so you know, that would seem to be related to the robustness of this, these types of things to noise in the quantum setting. And I'm wondering if this is something that people have thought about. So to some extent, it ends up inheriting some of the, the, the same kind of robustness, because fundamentally, the integrators that we can carry out, because we're limited to applying unitary transformations, they're all symplectic or approximately symplectic. And so because they're, uh, uh, they have that property, there really isn't any, any more than linear blow up in the air due to, due to finite gates. So we don't run into that problem. But the problem is, of course, because we're dealing with unitary uh, dynamics, it sometimes becomes very hard to conceive of how we would block and code uh, a more sophisticated integrator that isn't necessarily symplectic. So I would say symplectic is not sufficient for it to be, um, for it to always perform well in stiff equations. You can still have blow up. Um, I mean, it's classical integration of an MD. I mean, you can use symplectic integrators, and some of them will have this blow up in some Fair. But I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at is specifically for integration of the Schrodinger equation, where from the, the, un, from the unitarity, you can end up arguing, worst case scenario, there's going to be, if you've got machine epsilon and n gates, you're going to be uh, you know, or, uh, epsilon n at most away from your solution. So there, isn't, there, there can't be a blow up in the context of the Schrodinger equation. But obviously, other dynamical systems, yeah. OK, great. So let's hold other questions for the panel discussion. We have, we're going to break for just 10 minutes, and then we're going to come back, and we'll have uh, plenty more time for, for other questions. Let's thank uh, both. Uh, Thanks a lot.